I've now got the great, great pleasure to introduce Pablo Bronstein and Lizzie Carey Thomas. Uh, Pablo was born in Buenos Aires and works with drawings, paintings, installations, films, and performances. And very often, there are references to architectural styles ranging from the Baroque to the postmodern. Um, he does architectural interventions. He also works on performances, very often with groups of dancers. And then, of course, there are the exhibitions. Um, some of his uh, many shows include, most recently, I'm sure many of you have seen this show, the sketches for Regency Living at the ICA here in London. Also, a solo exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York called Pablo Bronstein at the Met. And also related to the garden, Garden a la Mode, at the Art Now Sculpture Commission at Tate Britain. Pablo will be in conversation with Lizzie Carey Thomas. Lizzie Carey Thomas joined Tate Britain in 1999, where she is curator of contemporary art. She runs the Art Now series and has done many exhibitions there, projects by Ian Kerr, by Mark Titchener, by Michael Fullerton, by Christina Mackey, by Pablo Bronstein, and most recently also, the show is still on, by Ed Atkins. A very, very warm welcome to Pablo Bronstein and Lizzie Carey Thomas. Yeah, it's on. Hi. So, um, Pablo, I wanted to start by talking a bit about the project that Hans Ulrich mentioned that you did at Tate Britain last year, Garden a la Mode. And um, this is a project for Tate Britain's Sculpture Court. Um, this is a, a space that's framed by a rather awkward collision of the grand neoclassical facade of the original Tate Gallery building and the postmodern extension designed by James Sterling in the early 1980s. And for somebody who's constantly layering different aesthetic languages, this seemed to me the absolutely perfect setting for a piece by you. There's a picture of it there. And what you did was um, introduce uh, various um, elements to the sculpture court that on first appearance seemed rather subtle, these were trees and um, shrubs and garden statuary, reproduction garden statuary based on 18th century designs, which are now commonly seen upgrading the suburban garden. Um, and as well as these elements, um, there was a giant topiary obelisk, which you can just see in the background, like an inflated classical symbol, and a semicircular carved stone bench that the audience was invited to sit on to contemplate the... Um, the obelisk from. So the audience themselves became a, a sort of mobile ornamentation within this composition. And this was further, um, this idea was further elaborated in a performance that you did where the audience um, watched dancers perform tragic endings of Shakespearean plays using a series of very stylized gestures. So um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your relationship to um, the plaza, because in many ways the sculpture court at Tate Britain is like a forgotten municipal square of the building, of the gallery. And the plaza's featured in your work regularly since 2004, 2005. Could you talk a little bit about that and your relationship to, to that idea of a so of social space? Mm, well, yeah, well, the... Um the reason for looking at plazas or piazzas at the beginning um, uh, w was that I, I think I was using it as a sort of example of um, the distortions that architectural styles can have on our perception of a public space, um, and in particular how architecture can be used quite cynically um, to get in particular political or economic agendas into public space. Um, very often... What, what had happened, and I, th I think, well, it's still going on. Um, uh, we own a bit of land, if, we, if we're stupid and obvious about it. We own a bit of land. Corporation comes in. Um, they tart it up to make it look like it's still in public ownership, but it is now, it is now private. Um, and for that to be effective, um, classicism is normally used in one way or another. Uh, it has to somehow evoke 
publicness, citizenship, and, and classical architecture, postmodern classicism is, is, is very often absolutely perfect to, to con us into thinking that it is still very public. It makes us feel like we own it. Um, and, and, and so I, I started to play around with, 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 with piazzas in, in that capacity, and, and then came the uh, Tate Triennial 2006 or something, and, and, and you guys asked me to... to design, along with Celine Condorelli, to design the kind of orientation piazza at the, at the opening of the exhibition. And this orientation piazza had to include, I mean, at first it was just an artwork, and then it had to include um, uh, coffee, catalogues, orientation, um, uh, information stuff, uh, tables and chairs, um, books, um, and shops and everything else. And I had a complete freak out and drew this sort of architectural void on the floor and said, within this, the uh, institution is complicit in creating this as a void, as a non-commercial, non non-buzzword non space. Um, and this became a sort of piazza, and, and then on that came a performance, a performance of, of sort of ideal citizenship somehow. And just to describe that performance a little bit more, and also the way um, this, this void was marked out using green tape that was the same green as the sterling trim that you see on the um, claw gallery there, um, was literally just taped out on the floor with an X in the middle. And um, not only did it very subtly alter people's uh, wanderings through the space, because naturally we like to, to avoid demarcations as we move through space, but also it w served as a stage for your performance where a number of um, dancers, amateur Baroque enthusiasts, I believed, were um, walking the lines, uh, performing a, s a series of um, gestures that combined modern dance with Baroque movement. There, there, were, there were a series of re reinterpretations of, of, of Baroque gestures somehow uh, and their classical ballet legacy um, and then reworking that back through certain kind of Laban movement but um, but but what 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 I think was important about that was that the uh, movement was conceived as highly highly artificial somehow and this leads me on to another piece that you did shortly afterwards in New York for performer in 2007 called Plaza Minuet where um, the audience actually moved around four different corporate lobbies in the financial buildings in the financial district, along with a troupe of dancers, classically trained dancers, who were then instructed to hold a series of contraposto baroque movements under your instruc instruction, which was barked out very abruptly yeah, to them. Yeah, th there you can see me and my assistant choreographer, and we're basically abusing these poor teenagers. <laughs> And it was, I mean, I was, I was there for that, and it was extraordinary how you um, not only were choreographing the dancers, but also the audience to move from one lobby to another. And one of the lobbies was actually the Winter Garden in the World Financial Centre, um, just next to the World Trade Centre site. I think that's it there with its mock... No, the World Financial Centre is, is this one up here. That one. Yeah. <coughs> um, and for me, that seemed like the most highly artificial piece I've seen by you. Um, not only this sort of these very strange postmodern lobbies, this idea of um, this very contrived movement happening alongside um, bustling normal workers going to and from their offices, but also you as the director um, uh, leading these performers through their series of gestures, correcting them when they were wrong. This idea of everything being on the surface, this very overt artifice and role playing well, well the the, the import i guess the important thing is that the that the command is made explicit the kind of art creation is made visible as a gesture you know and the dancers to some extent seem to um extend um the be an extension of the decor of the lobby but also uh, an aberration of normal pedestrian movement that was going on around you yep <laughs> Okay, good. Glad we agree <laughs> about that. <laughs> this is meant to be your conversation here. <laughs> so uh, I just w maybe this is a good point to move on to talking about landscape, because here you're using the, the landscape, the city of New York as your canvas in a way. Well, I mean, physically yes, exactly. I mean, it. in a way, what we did was we, we chose these four postmodern lobbies 
in downtown financial district. And we kind of created, or well, superimposed a grid, a kind of macro grid onto New York, a little bit like the sort of um, uh, the, 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 the void, architectural void symbol that the dancers are performing on. Um, and we bust the dancers betwe between them. But the, the important thing really for me about these spaces was that, that they are technically public spaces. Um, and there is a, there is a, I mean, the, the reason why they're public in these huge financial buildings is that uh, there is a, a sort of um, a, a loophole whereby if you say that you give your ground floor to the public, or to public use, which normally means you stick some terrazzo and some fake palm trees up and you allow tramps to eat their sort of, well, not even eat their sandwiches, um, then you can build your building a good deal higher. Um, and so, it, in, a, in a way, it made it quite easy. We had every right to, to be doing this in, in, these, in these environments. Um, but, yeah, so going back to this idea of, of you using the city as the canvas, um, I wanted to then talk about um, some of your projects which have actually happened in a very specific landscape setting uh, as objects. And I'm thinking of the piece that you did for Grisdale, um, yes. in Cumbria, yeah, exactly. chicken coop. Exactly. I mean, th this, this is the sort of typical um, architectural bauble in a landscape. It's, it's a chicken coop, and it, it's an ornament. It's, it's tacky. It's made of styrofoam and whatever. But, it, but in a way, it, it's, its role is not far different from that of any folly in, in, in any English garden. I mean, in, in, a, in a sense, all it does is it turns the landscape rather self-consciously into a picture. Um, and in a way, with Grisdale, that was important, or is important, because that's what Grisdale do. They kind of explore these ideas of, of art and image on the landscape. But there is obviously a whole branch of, of, of contemporary art that uh, is all about getting your wellies muddy, and I'm not really into that. And so this felt like a kind of quite hands-off comment on that sort of stuff. Um, uh, this is the post-fact fundraising picture. Um, Let's see. But, but, but in a way, I, I think the important thing about, about that is that there is a move from these very simple, um, well, very traditional ideas about uh, garden structures or garden ornaments um, to something that is more, a little, more about a kind of garden or ornament as a machine in which humans play a part. And I think the Tate um, Garden a la Mode is an in-between stage in that in which we have uh, we have use of it. It's not like we just look at it. We have use of it, and we may be led by it. We may happen to sit down on a bench without really realizing or walk through in a particular way without realizing that, in fact, the art is pushing us in those directions. But it's um, it gets made, I think, more explicit in a piece I did in the Chisholm uh, about, well, a couple of years ago, um, which is a sort of flash installation um, that sort of happened as an opening. Um, it's just done by chairs. Uh, it's got something obviously institutional in the kind of chair stuff. Um, and that was very funny because it, it was a one-night-only event and everyone turned up for a performance um, and then became the performance because mm. as you found yourself funneling through these plastic chairs and standing rather awkwardly with your bottle of beer. Yes. And this awkwardness um, is sometimes extremely explicit in your work. I'm thinking of another piece you did at the ICA in 2005, um, where you created a very low-level wall, essentially, that occupied almost the whole floor of a, a single gallery. And the wall was uh, low enough for you to climb over it, but of course nobody did. And all of the audience was pushed out to the sides of the gallery. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and, and I think uh, th this sense of ex well, artificiality of, of behavior, something that, that, that pulls up in this, in this last project that I've just finished for uh, the Migros Museum uh, that took place on a hill out outside Zurich in this kind of pretend farm or this sort of um, organic apple juice farm. And the idea was that, um, well, uh, the idea was that we have something that is on the outside a very pretty um, garden um, ornament, a kind of Aldo Rossian meta-architectural blob. Um, uh, there's the there's the um, 
the, the hills, uh, the, the lake in outside Zurich and blah de blah. Um, and it opens up on the inside to be um, a, a theatre, a kind of condensed Baroque experience that is multi-layered and literally hierarchized the way a, a Baroque theatre might be hierarchized with the musicians in the pit, um, uh, the singer on a balcony and the audience uh, of uh, five rich collectors with sprained ankles on the top, and they all had to scramble up. Um, uh, this is where the this is where the um, uh, singer enters from and performs a single aria by Alessandro Scarlatti, which is a very very sort of serpentine aria, a very very artificial, um, a, a high camp exercise in in dying in the desert, pretty much. Um, and so the, the green also natural in a sort of camp way. Um, and this, I mean, going back to this idea of awkwardness and participation, I mean, this is an extreme end of that, really. Um, I mean, I'll talk about another project in a minute, which also I think is worth mentioning here, but in that you're in this very condensed, cramped space, um, being forced into a confrontation with the performer. You're no longer um, just sitting in the dark, unobserved. You're actually being asked to participate in a rather extreme fashion. And um, I'm the other project I was referring to is one you did um, this year at Kunsthal Charlottenburg, where you turned the entire gallery into a pissoir. Could you y talk about that? It, yes, it's, it's not... I mean, we turned the gallery into a sewer around the pissoir, and the pissoir was a very large structure, structure within the gallery space, you know. Uh, I mean, oh, sorry, I'm, I forgot to pan. This is the singer. She's acting out a bit. Um, but, so, sorry, y y yes, yes, I, I'm not quite sure how to link that. <laughs> sorry. I was thinking about this idea of moving from follies and landscapes, objects and landscapes, through to an idea of participation and, and awkwardness and mm. extreme behaviour on the part of the viewer. And perhaps that's at one end of an idea of extreme, what you're asking your audience to do. Y yes, I, yeah, I, I mean, I in a sense, the, the, the important thing about the piece why, is that it's in an architectural language of sort of extreme classicism and the high, high, high public architectural style, you know, the style of the French Revolution, uh, post-revolution, post the style of, of courthouses and, and parliament buildings and so on. Um, and so the idea, is, the, the idea is that somehow within this very, very public language, there is this lockable door and this moment of being alone with your fluids and becoming an animal again, just peeing or whatever it might be. Um, uh, that was all, it's all in speech marks. It's, 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 it's highly ironic and it's, and it's a real performance. And I have to say I had real performance anxiety when I was there. I actually couldn't produce... Just to, um, <laughs> just to to state the obvious, visitors were invited to go and actually pee in the pissoir, which went directly onto the mm. gallery floor. Mm. So there's this cumulative smell that occurred throughout the exhibition. Yeah, they, they were really worried actually. In the uh, the consul Charlottenburg about it not smelling enough. Um, because they're Scandinavian, they want to do things properly, and so they were worried, and they're quite right, you know, actually urine doesn't smell that much, and they had to get these trays of stale urine and leave them underneath to <laughs> waft. I hope they've managed to <laughs> dissipate that now. <laughs> so, um, the, the Zurich, going back to the Zurich performance piece, um, these performances were staged periodi periodically, and was it to an invited audience, or was it, could anyone just show up to... Participate. Well, I mean, it, it's not invited. I mean, people queue up. Here they are queuing. But um, it, there is a clear, clearly sort of, it's a, a, a very, very restricted number. We had to really negotiate. Migros, I, I said I initially wanted it to be for one or two or three people. I mean, the idea is that the audience gaze is very, very, very controlled and that you are caught in the performance very, very consciously. Um, and I wanted that to be as... as tight as possible, uh, and, and there was a general freak out in the museum that you couldn't possibly do it, so we negotiated and we ended up with about five, five or six people, which is, which is not very many, um, considering it's in theory uh, publicly, or sort of publicly funded. But I mean, in a way, uh, abuse is part of the work, and, and mistreatment is part of the work. It's, it's about 
um, barbed artificiality. I mean, it's not meant for us to eat soup underneath a, you know, underneath the pavilion. It's something else. It's about it's about um, high culture. And that that idea of sort of um, vulgarness was almost interwoven into the structure in the way, or the, rather this interior contrasting with this very conservative classical exterior. And am I right, I haven't seen the piece, but am I right in saying that actually to enter it, you had to pull down a ladder, which is a bit like the structure itself sticking out its tongue. I think Catherine Wood mentioned that in her essay. Y yes, it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of, um, it's a sort of hurdy-gurdy, um, funfair type thing, the whole thing. Um, and given how natural the environment was, how natural in speech marks, because it's, like I said before, it's totally f fake as a farm. Um, the idea was that we put in something that is a, a goofy theatre in a sense, you know. But, but it, it's, it's um, cruelty, I think, also is a spatial one. It's about making it physically uncomfortable to be within this setting, and, and, that's, and that's a sort of... Um, uh, well, it gives me pleasure. Okay, well, that's a good place to finish. Thank you very much, Pablo. Thanks.